So today my talk will focus uh, on linear algebra problems and how to use uh, randomization to solve those problems uh, when you have a large scale. Uh, so it's a joint work with uh, Oleg Balabanov, who was a postdoc in our group, uh, Matthias Boper and Eduard Timsit, uh, who are PhD students, and Eduard is currently a PhD student, and uh, Victor Lederer, who is a software engineer. And uh, all the work is funded, funded by this CRC Synergy Grant uh, that we have with Eric Ansaez, uh, and Yvonne Made and Jean-Philippe uh, Pigmal from uh, Sorbonne University. So I will start with the motivation of our work, then I will briefly introduce uh, random, uh, random sketching, and then I will focus on how do we use this in uh, Krilov subspace methods to solve linear systems of equations or eigenvalue problems. And um, first I will discuss how we use this to orthogonalize a set of vectors, and this was mentioned previously as being one of the bottlenecks when you want to use those solvers and you want to use uh, large-scale machines, and then we'll see how this is used in Arnoldi and uh, GMRES, uh, and then also full orthogonalization method before going to block relof methods and discussing uh, eigenvalue problems. Okay, so let me start with the motivation. This was mentioned already, but uh, when we look at these large scale computers, we see two technological trends. One is the increased cost of uh, communication with respect to the cost required to, uh, to do floating pointing operations, and there is really an, in, an exponentially increasing gap uh, in between those two costs. Uh, so if we look at the cost per, uh, per floating point operations, there is an improvement over time because uh, now you can add multiple cores per, per socket, or uh, you could use uh, larger vectorization units, or you could use those uh, TPUs, so this cost uh, keeps decreasing, but if we look at the communication cost, both on one sequential machine or one parallel machine, the improvements are really much, much uh, slower. So here I just took the example of, um, of the interconnect latency. So if you send one message between two processors, uh, it's, uh, it's a few microseconds. And so that's really a bottleneck, and if we look at the latency over time, it's decreasing really, really slowly, sometimes even increasing. So that's really a bottleneck that we have uh, to address. Another trend is uh, heterogeneity. So we've seen in the previous talks that we have to use GPUs, uh, some scalable vector extensions, of course, multi-cores, and also the multiple uh, precisions of floating point arithmetic, because if we are used to doing um, double precision, or single precision, and if you go from double to single, you expect a factor of two improvement in terms of time and memory consumption. Now you can use those even lower precisions like BFLOW16, and then you can get larger factors. So it's really important to be able to use this um, lower precision. So some of the um, some of the venues we explore in our group is to develop communication avoiding algorithms, so those will be algorithms that probably minimize communication, uh, and so we have algorithms for LU factorization, QR factorization, and so on. Uh, but now recently we focus on randomization techniques, uh, because here you can reduce also the flops in addition to the communication. And of course, uh, we are interested in these multiple precision algorithms, uh, while we look at uh, how do we control the loss of accuracy in, uh, in those algorithms. And so I'll explain why randomization is really uh, suitable for these multiple precision algorithms, and uh, uh, mainly I'll focus on this um, orthogonalization process, and uh, we'll see that this reduces communication and arithmetic complexity, and we'll see how this, we exploit the mixed precision arithmetic, and then I'll move on and discuss randomized Arnoldi for Krilov, and uh, block reload methods. So with this uh, motivation, let's uh, see first what's random sketching. So random sketching is uh, a technique which consists in embedding a high dimensional subspace. So uh, a subspace which lives in Rn, and n is going to be very, very large, into a low dimensional one, Rk, and k is going to be much, much smaller than n, while some geometry is preserved with high probability. So it received a lot of attention in the last 15 years, and uh, it's really well developed for least-square problems, for 
computing the low rank approximation of a matrix. So randomized SVD now is widely used for doing data compression, column subset selection, but was sort of overlooked for a Krylov subspace methods. And so that's the focus of today's talk. How do we use this for Krylov subspace methods? And so when we talk about this uh, random sketching, uh, very often we are using this um, aspect, which is an oblivious subspace embedding. So independent of the data we are embedding. And uh, this oblivious subspace embedding uh, says the following. So if we are giving a random matrix omega of dimensions k by n, and k is going to be the dimension of the sketch, and n is the dimension of the initial subspace, then this omega is called an oblivious subspace embedding if uh, with probability at least one minus delta for any m dimensional subspace V, for all pairs of vectors in this subspace, we have uh, this uh, relation which is satisfied. And which says the following, if we look at the inner product of those two vectors, and then we look at the inner product of, of their sketches, so those are going to be vectors of much, much smaller dimension, then this inner product is pre preserved up to the accuracy epsilon and the two norm of the two vectors. So when we preserve this sketch inner product, we also preserve the norm of the vectors, the distance in between those vectors. So that's uh, the geometry we preserve when we do this uh, random sketching. And so we go to a much, much smaller dimensional uh, space. So now the question is, uh, how do we choose this omega and uh, what's the sketch dimension k, which will ensure that we'll satisfy this uh, property? So there are, there are several choices for this omega. So one will be to choose omega to be a matrix whose entries are independent standard normal random variables uh, rescaled. So if we take such, uh, such omega and now consider that we have uh, m vectors and those m vectors will be stored in the matrix W uh, and we, we sketch those vectors. So we compute omega times W then the sketch dimension k is proportional to epsilon to minus 2, m, the number of vectors, and a logarithmic of 1 over delta. How much it takes to compute? Uh, we multiply two dense matrices, so it's two m and k floating point operations. And of course, it's very easy to parallelize because if w is distributed over many processors and omega as well, then we just uh, compute locally the product of local omega i times w i, and then we just do a sum reduce to get, uh, to get our sketch. Uh, so it's a very good choice, uh, but then there is only one problem here is that in terms of floating point op operations we are proportional to the sketch dimension. So for accuracy, sometimes we need to increase uh, this sketch dimension, and so it would be good to have something which doesn't depend on the sketch dimension. And so, there is a lot of research on how to take this omega to be some fast transform. And so such a choice is uh, 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 omega, which is called a subsample randomized Hadamard transform, which, which has this form here. So it's formed by a diagonal matrix uh, with diagonal with independent random signs, followed by a normalized Walsh Hadamard transform, and then followed by an R matrix which draws K rows uniformly at random uh, from this matrix, and then a rescaling. So if we apply to these two vectors, the, the idea is the following. I like to draw from my vector K, uh, K components at, at random while preserving the norm. But now I can have a very sparse vector. I can have many, many zeros. So if I just draw uh, uniformly at random some entries, I can end up with a vector with all zeros. So clearly I don't, I don't preserve the norm. So the idea is to first apply this diagonal matrix, then apply this uh, Hadamard transform, which will spread the norm of the vectors over all its entries, then draw some entries at random, and then rescale. So uh, the Walsh Hadamard transform is a discrete analog of the fast Fourier transform. So you can apply this uh, efficiently to a vector. And so if we look at how many operations we need to do now to sketch m vectors is m n log n. So we don't depend anymore on the sketch dimension. Uh, and then that's the sketch dimension which we will require, which is epsilon to minus 2, as in the Gaussian case. And then we have a logarithmic factor uh, here, additionally. 
But now it's difficult to parallelize because it, it, it's like parallelizing the FFT. If you go to very large number of processors, it has a, a sort of more complicated communication pattern than, than just the sum reduce here. So what we did first was to develop a block subsample randomized Hadamard transform. And uh, this, uh, so uh, I'm missing an equal sign here. But now we, we can write this omega matrix like blocks of columns. Uh, and then uh, if we look at each block, it's composed by a diagonal matrix as before with independent random signs, then a Hadamard transform, then the, a uniform sampling matrix, and then another diagonal matrix. And so now we can perform everything in parallel because each processor will, will do this application of diagonal matrix, local Hadamard transform, subsampling, another diagonal, and then a sum reduce. So it's becoming as efficient in terms of parallelization as when we are using a Gaussian matrix. And so if we, uh, if we do this kind of uh, log subsample randomized Hadamard transform, form, uh, uh, let me show you what I'm, what I'm getting here. So uh, I will focus only on this graph here, which uh, was done in Julia. So I'm sometimes doing things in Julia just to see what performance you can get if you just write a few lines of code. And so we have here a matrix, which is 64,000 uh, rows. And, and then we take uh, vectors m equal to 256 or 512. And now we apply the Gaussian sampling. And so this is going to be uh, here for 256 in dashed line, uh, and then for 512 here. And so, and we increase the sampling size. And down here, you have the, uh, the subsample randomized Sadaman transform. So you can see that the runtime doesn't increase with increasing the sampling size. So that's what we wanted. While if you use Gaussian, then you, you increase uh, proportional to the sampling size. And so as I was saying, why it's important, because sometimes you want to increase the sampling size to get more accuracy in, in the algorithm. Uh, and, and then some other tests which uh, were performed uh, on a parallel machine. And uh, there are a couple of results here. So for example, in terms of uh, strong scaling, uh, we take a matrix which has 10 to the 7 rows and 200 vectors. And then the sketch dimension in, is 10 times this number of vectors. And then we increase the number of processors. And in red, you have the Gaussian uh, sketching. And then in black here, we have the block subsample randomized Adama transform. And uh, it separates the time spent in uh, computation. Uh, which is uh, represented by the triangles, and uh, the circles represent the overall time. So you can see uh, the difference uh, will, will be spent in the MPI sum or reduce. Uh, and so you could see that uh, the time decreases nicely for both of them. Uh, and here something happens on the machine, but we don't know why, what really, but it's coming from the MPI. Because if we look at the computation, that decreases as uh, expected. Uh, and then, of course, what's important as well is that in terms of memory, uh, it's much less memory consuming when we use this Hadamard transform with respect to Gaussian matrix that you have to generate a store if you really want to call a blast three routine to, to be efficient. So, so the memory per processor for the block subsample randomized Hadamard transform decreases nicely, while the Gaussian in this part here, we, we couldn't store the matrix on the processor. So we were able only to run with the Gaussian matrix uh, down, down here when, uh, when the matrix was, uh, was uh, larger. So for this matrix here, which now has 10 to the 8 rows and 200 uh, vectors. Uh, also in terms of uh, weight scaling, now if we increase uh, the number of uh, rows to keep the same size of the matrix per processor, we get quite nicely behavior for the block subsample randomized Hadamard transform where at some point here this uh, increases uh, because probably there are some cache issues when you increase too much and you use a dense matrix. So this part has focused on showing that sketching is efficient because randomization is, import is, is, uh, you know, uh, is, is appropriate to use if sketching is uh, efficient because we want this sketching to be, to be quick. Uh, and so uh, now let's move on. Uh, on how do we use this for, uh, for Krilov subset methods? 
And so if we look at the grill of suspect methods, and the most expensive part in terms of communication is coming from orthogonalizing a set of vectors. So I will start first by showing how do we randomize uh, this uh, orthogonalization process. And so uh, Gram-Schmidt is really what's used widely for doing this orthogonalization. And in Gram-Schmidt, we are given a set of uh, linearly independent vectors here, W1 up to Wn. They are given one by one, because you can imagine as a trial of suspect solver, we build those vectors one by one. And so we want to construct an orthogonal basis of those vectors. In other words, we compute the QR factorization of this W matrix. And so Gram-Schmidt process will uh, proceed as following. For each vector, Wj, we are given a projector on the subspace orthogonal to the subspace spanned by the previously orthogonalized vectors. Uh, we compute a new vector orthogonal to those vectors by using this projector, and then we normalize uh, the new uh, vector. And so now the point is, how do we choose this uh, uh, projector here? And there are typically two choices. The first one is to use a classical Gram-Schmidt. And so the projector will have this form, identity minus qj minus 1, qj minus 1 transpose, uh, which is efficient because now if you think of applying this to a vector, uh, then you would need, when you compute those inner products with qj minus 1 transpose, you need only one synchronization. Uh, so it's, it's efficient because it uses plus two matrix vector operations, but if we look at the loss of orthogonality, which is here measured as identity minus Q transpose Q L2 norm, then the loss of orthogonality uh, depends quadratically on the condition number of W, and then there is a constant here which depends on N, the dimension, large dimension of the vectors, and M square, uh, the M being the number of vectors. So it has stability issues, and if W is not well conditioned, then you can lose uh, orthogonality in, uh, in, 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 in the process. So then people will use modified Gram-Schmidt. And so uh, in the modified Gram-Schmidt, the projector has this form. So we orthogonalized against the first vector, the second vector, up to uh, J minus 1. Now, you see, if you think in parallel, then uh, you have to uh, do J minus 1 inner products, and so you have to do J minus 1 synchronizations. So it has a poor efficiency and plus 1 vector operations. Uh, and now if we look at the loss of orthogonality, then it depends linearly on the condition number of W, and then there is a constant here depending on NMM. So it has a, a better numerical uh, stability. So very often people will have to use a modified uh, Gram-Schmidt. Uh, and so what we wanted was to have something which is uh, efficient as classical Gram-Schmidt, but as stable as modified uh, Gram-Schmidt through randomization. And so uh, the main underlying idea relies on, on uh, this uh, property, which says the following. If I'm uh, uh, given a matrix uh, Q, and then I will take this sketching matrix omega, uh, to be an oblivious subspace in the embedding for the span of Q, then we have this relation which says that the condition number of Q is smaller than 1 plus O of epsilon, the condition of uh, the sketch, omega Q. And so the idea is if I do a sketch, I get something which is going to be small, and, and then I can use a, a very stable algorithm for orthogonalizing this matrix and get the condition number very close to 1. So that's going, omega Q, it's, it's, it's a sketch, so it's a small matrix. So I can do something uh, expensive, like householder QR, and we can also use mixed precision. Because if we want to get an accuracy in single precision, then when I get to a small problem here, I can increase the precision and go to double precision, but to make sure that I reach the single precision I want for my algorithm. So is that the sense of, uh, in which we use mixed precision? We have a large-scale problem. We want to get results in single precision. But when we project it and we got a small problem, then we increase the precision to double. But to make sure that we get our precision in the final result down to single precision. So, so the main idea is here, orthogonalize omega Q instead of Q. So in other words, uh, this means that we are taking an orthogonal projector with respect to the inner product induced by omega. And so this projector has this uh, form here. 
So identity minus QJ minus one, pseudo inverse of the sketch of QJ minus one, and then uh, omega. So in other words, uh, we obtain the factorization of the sketch of W as being S times R, uh, where S now is a sketch of this uh, Q matrix, and this is going to be L2 orthonormal. And then if we look at the factorization of Q uh, of W, we get now the Q matrix, which is not L2 orthonormal, but is orthogonal, orthogonal with respect to the sketched inner product. So we get a matrix which is uh, well conditioned. Not L2 orthonormal, but very well conditioned. And so if we look at the algorithm, what, what do we do? So when we are going to be given a new vector, then I have to apply this projector to the new vector. So first we sketch the new vector. Now we got a, a small problem to be solved. So we are going to solve this small least square problem. And by solving this uh, small least square problem, we get the coordinates of the vector in the basis, qj minus one. And then we multiply with qj minus one, do a subtraction, and we get new vector. So we got our new vector qj. From this, we sketch to, to get the sketch of this vector, and then we, we normalize. So we do less operations than classical Gram-Schmidt or modified Gram-Schmidt because we don't do any more this qj minus one transpose times the vector. We do some, uh, we do less operations. So we do twice less operations than uh, classical Gram-Schmidt, for example. It's not asymptotically less operations, it's just a factor of two. But what we gain is in number of uh, synchronizations. So what can we say in terms of uh, stability? So in terms of stability, we are assuming this uh, mixed precision model. So suppose we use single and double. Uh, we are going to say that in, uh, in single, we are going to do uh, all expensive operations. And we increase the precision to double if we have uh, operations which are on small dimensional vectors or which are, uh, uh, which, which are uh, fast, like the random projections. OK. and so. Uh, we also take into account uh, rounding errors. And with this, we can say the following. Uh, we are computing this Q hat factor and R factor hat. And then we can say that the QR this is a QR factorization of W because it's bounded by uh, a term which depends on the single precision we are using, m to the 3 half, and the Frobenius norm of uh, W. So we do get the QR factorization of uh, W. And now, if we look at the condition number of this Q hat, then uh, that's what uh, we obtain. So it's, it's close to one. We have this term here, which depends on the epsilon, and then a second term. And if we look at the second term, it depends linearly on the condition number of W and M squared. It's a different measure of the error, because for Gram-Schmidt, I was showing the loss of uh, orthogonality in terms of L2 norm of identity minus Q transpose Q. Here we look at the condition number of the matrix, but what we see is that we, like modify gram schmidt we depend linearly on the condition number, and we don't depend anymore on the large dimension. So it can be even uh, more accurate than modify gram schmidt so, so if I summarize uh, those um, orthogonalization procedures, uh, so I say in classical gram schmidt it's efficient because it relies on plus two matrix vector operations, only one synchronization, but it has stability issues. Modified Gram-Schmidt, I was saying it's um, less a poor efficiency because you have to do vector vector operations and J minus one synchronizations, but better numerical stability. And so if we go to randomized Gram-Schmidt, uh, it's, it's also blast to matrix vector operations, uh, only one synchronization, so it, it resembles the classical Gram-Schmidt, but the numerical stability, it's uh, similar or even better than modified Gram-Schmidt. So as efficient as classical Gram-Schmidt and as stable as modified Gram-Schmidt, or even more stable. Uh, okay. So now let me show you what we, we get in terms of um, accuracy and uh, some uh, performance results uh, here again in Julia. So for, in terms of accuracy, we, we are taking a synthetic function that we discretize on a grid so we get 300 vectors, uh, each of dimension 10 to the 6. And uh, we take this synthetic function because 
progressively uh, this um, matrix becomes uh, singular. And now we look at the condition number of the Q matrix we are building. And uh, so we, we do here uh, either unique precision, everything in single precision, or uh, mixed precision, as I was explaining, uh, we increase to double when we have uh, operations on small problems or uh, some random projections. And here you have the square root of the condition number of these uh, vectors. And uh, here you have the number of vectors which are progressively um, orthogonalized, either through CGS, MGS, or randomized Gram-Schmidt. And so when you get around here, the matrix becomes um, really badly conditioned, and then uh, it becomes uh, basically uh, singular. Uh, and so uh, CGS, very quickly, the condition number uh, explodes. So it's clearly unstable for this matrix. Uh, we can do CGS uh, two, so calling twice uh, CGS, and uh, that's uh, that's represented here. Uh, so that uh, is is stable up to here, but then also the condition number uh, grows a lot. Now, if we look at the modified Gram-Schmidt, is uh, red squares. So you can see that when the matrix becomes badly conditioned, the condition number increases, but uh, but it still remains well conditioned, so it could be used. And if we look at the randomized uh, version, so those are the ones in blue, and here you have the one which is, um, for example, uh, single precision only, so the condition number increases at some point uh, up to 100, but then if we use this mixed precision, we get something which remains uh, very close to one. So something which remains uh, very stable, even more, more stable than the modified Gram-Schmidt. So Julia now, uh, just to show you again what kind of uh, improvements we would get, and uh, let me look for example at the double precision. Uh, this will be a CGS uh, in time, in seconds. Then this will be modified Gram-Schmidt, so you see clearly that even here it's in sequential, uh, it's uh, more expensive. And then this will be this randomized Gram-Schmidt, uh, which is a uh, as you are thinking, uh, same time as CGS uh, and uh, uh, yeah, um, faster than MGS, uh, and of course no optimization here. So if you, if one would optimize harder uh, and in parallel, then this will uh, be even more efficient. So potentially more efficient than CGS because it does uh, twice less operations, but only a factor of two. So that's a really um, stable algorithm. We tested on many, many matrices. I'm just showing this one here, but it does remain stable uh, for, for uh, many matrices. So now let me move on to, to Krylov. So in Krylov suspect methods, we are solving A, X equal B, and um, we, we are solving this by starting from an initial solution at X0, an initial residual R0, and then the Krylov suspect method, we find a sequence of approximants x1 up to xm that will minimize some measure of the error over these uh, subspaces uh, by satisfying two conditions. The first one is a subspace condition, so the solution belongs to x0 plus the Krylov suspect generated at iteration m. And the second condition is a petrov galerkin condition, which uh, says that the residual is orthogonal to a well-defined subspace LM. Um, and the Krylov subspace uh, is built as uh, the subspace bound by R0 and powers of the matrix A multiplied by R0. And of course, because we want this uh, uh, subspace uh, to, to have an increasing dimension, then uh, typically we orthogonalize the subspace by, by using the Arnoldi process. Uh, and so, uh, let me mention two instances of this Krylov projection method. Uh, the first one uh, is, uh, belongs to the class of orthogonal projection methods because we take this LM to be equal to the Krylov subspace uh, at iteration M. And so, in this case, uh, a, when A is symmetric and positive definite, uh, then this is uh, equivalent to finding a solution which minimizes A norm of uh, the error. 
And of course, one of the very used algorithms is the conjugate gradient, which in addition has a short recurrence uh, and does require to store uh, all the basis vectors. And uh, for, um, full orthogonalization method form will uh, store all those vectors and uh, orthogonalize against all the previous vectors at each iteration. Another class uh, is formed by algorithms in which Lm is taken to be A multiplied with the Krilov subspace at iteration M. And then, for example, in GNRS, uh, then the solution is found by minimizing uh, the residual at each iteration over uh, this uh, subspace. So that belongs to the class of minimal residual uh, methods. Uh, and so, uh, in Krilov subspace methods, what we use is the Arnoldi process, which uh, generates a basis for this Krilov subspace uh, by doing the Gram Schmidt uh, factorization of this uh, Arnoldi matrix. And so, by doing this Arnoldi process, uh, we obtain an orthonormal basis QM and an upper Hessenberg matrix HM, uh, which satisfy uh, this uh, Arnoldi uh, relation. So A multiplies Q from iteration M minus one equal QM HM, where HM is a upper Heisenberg matrix. So what do we do in randomized Arnoldi? So what we are going to do is to replace this orthogonalization through Gram-Schmidt by the randomized Gram-Schmidt process. And so we, we just do this replacement and what do we obtain? We obtain the same uh, relation being satisfied by now Q is not L to orthonormal but is orthonormal with respect to the sketch inner product. So the sketch of Q is L to orthonormal, not Q itself. But as we were seeing before, Q is going to be uh, really very well uh, conditioned. Uh, and so when we do a GMRS now, if we look in more details as a GMRS algorithm with Gram-Schmidt, um, you all know this, I'm, uh, I'm sure, but just to make the difference with randomized Gram-Schmidt, then we, we iterate, and each, each iteration we obtain a new vector by multiplying A with the previously orthogonalized vectors, and now we use Gram-Schmidt to orthogonalize this new vector against all the previously uh, orthogonalized vectors. And then after doing this uh, uh, number of iterations, we get the Heisenberg matrix, and then uh, we, we find the solution by um, minimizing the residual over the uh, Krilov subspace, and we obtain uh, a solution. Now, when you when go to GMRS with randomized Gram-Schmidt, so basically we replace this orthogonalization with randomized Gram-Schmidt, and then uh, we, we solve uh, the same minimization problem with the Heisenberg matrix, uh, but let me just show you uh, in terms of cost. So in terms of cost, as I'm mentioning, uh, if I'm using here CGS, then the flops is just a factor of two uh, smaller and the same number of synchronizations. But of course, that's going to be uh, stable. While here, if you have a more difficult problem, very quickly you, you lose uh, orthogonality and you get in trouble with, with converging. Uh, another point is a solution. So how do we obtain the solution? So this minimizes the L to norm of the residual and this minimizes the L to norm of the sketched residual. So that's the difference in, in GMRS uh, when we use this uh, randomized Arnoldi procedure. But you can show, we show that this is a quasi-optimal minimizer of the residual because uh, the, now here the, uh, the minimization problem uh, depends on the condition number of Q and we've seen that the condition number of Q is the square root of one plus epsilon divided by one minus epsilon. So that's why we can say that's a quasi-optimal uh, solution we are getting here for randomized GMRS. Uh, so again, some, uh, some um, numerical experiments in which uh, we, we look at the condition number of the bases, and then we look at the convergence we obtain in GMRS. Uh, everything in single precision. And we take here a matrix uh, which comes from Tim Davis's collection. That's a collection of matrices we are using a lot in linear algebra if you want to test and see if the method works for many applications. It happens here that this one is a pseudo-potential method. Um, and the results here are just MATLAB. And um, we see the same behavior as before. So as the condition number of, uh, of the basis um, increases, if we look at the, these uh, vectors, then we see that CGS very quickly will become unstable. And if we look at 
uh, and the residual, residual obtained in GMRES, then here uh, it, it stagnates. Uh, then if we look at uh, MGS, uh, the condition number here increases uh, and then uh, by, by Z time uh, GMRES got here and now it, it stagnates as well. And if we look at the randomized versions, uh, those uh, are um, in blue here and, and down here you can see that we converse to uh, what, what's expected because it's single precision. CGS2 doing twice this classical Gram-Schmidt would work as well. And, and now let me move on to, to the other class of uh, methods which uh, are uh, orthogonal projection methods. So in this case, as I was saying, the, in, in the krylov sasser methods, the petrov galerkin condition will impose that the residual is orthogonal to the Krylov subspace. Now, if we do the, the randomized version, we impose that the sketch petrov galerkin condition is uh, fulfilled, which means that if I'm looking at the Krylov subspace and the residual, I, I impose that the sketches of those vectors are uh, orthogonal. So that becomes a randomized orthogonal projection method when we impose this uh, condition here. Uh, so, but, but now the things are becoming more complicating. So we are not minimizing anymore the residual, but we are minimizing the A norm of, uh, of the error. And, and um, when we do this randomized form, uh, as before, we are getting this uh, uh, Arnoldi relation and, and that's the second relation which is obtained. And uh, when we would do the deterministic real of suspect method, there will be no omega here. So we'll get QM transpose AQM equals the Hessenberg matrix. So the Hessenberg matrix uh, will, will be symmetric. And because it's upper Hessenberg, it becomes three diagonal. And then you get the short recurrence that you can exploit in CG-like algorithms. When we do randomization, that's not anymore uh, symmetric, which means uh, the H matrix rem remains upper Hessenberg, and you cannot ha have any more uh, short recurrence. So we need to keep all the vectors of the basis and orthogonalize against all those uh, vectors. And in, in terms of convergence, uh, that's what we, we obtain. So for example, I, uh, we take a matrix which is really well conditioned, uh, and then we look at the uh, orthogonal projection method, and then the randomized version. Uh, and then you can see that they, they sort of uh, follow the same uh, convergence. Uh, they have the same convergence behavior. Then we take something which is a bit, uh, with the condition 10 to the 5 here, and it solves the same behavior. But then we get something which is uh, more difficult to solve. That's an elasticity problem, condition number 10 to the 9. And then what you can see is the randomized method has these uh, spikes. So the deterministic method has this nice convergence and the randomized method has some spikes, which can be two orders of magnitude larger than the error in the de deterministic method. But once the spike happens, then it, it sort of follows the same uh, convergence behavior. And so we started looking into what kind of uh, guarantees we can get for such a uh, randomized method, and that's the first, uh, first uh, kind of a guarantee, which is sort of straightforward to obtain, which tells me that if I now, now that's the solution you would get by, the, by imposing the petrov galerkin condition in Krylov suspect methods, uh, and then that's, a con that's, a, uh, that's the error we would get if we use a randomized method, and you can sh we can show that it's bounded by this quantity here, which appear, makes appearing the condition number of uh, A, uh, square root of the condition number. Uh, and, and so that's a sort of a pessimistic bound because we didn't see this dependency on the condition number. Uh, but, but clearly, if we have to respect uh, this bound, then it would mean that uh, we'll have to take the sketch to be larger than M, the number of vectors, multiplied by the condition number of A. So the sketch dimension would be too large to make this method interesting at all. But that's a pessimistic bound, and we continued working, and then we found a different bound which has this form here. So uh, we get this um, term here uh, where we have two uh, terms, alpha m and beta m, and some complicated expressions here. 
uh, that those are very recent results. So we are still uh, looking at understanding what we are obtaining. And um, what I want to show is that with this bound, we really capture the spikes. So if we take this bound and uh, we, we, we take here a matrix and we, we look at the uh, form deterministic method with a convergence like this, and then the randomized method where you see those spikes in the convergence, as it converges um, at the end, but you, you keep seeing those spikes. And then what you see in green here, it, it's a bound. And up here is a value of uh, square root of one plus alpha square in purple, and then in green we have the value of one plus beta square. And so you could see that the bound in green down here follows the spikes. So it really captures those spikes. So it's quite tight. And then we see the alpha matches the spikes here. And once it starts converging, it's a beta term which matches the, the spikes. And then the alpha remains uh, quite constant. So it's, it's a sort of a tight bound. Uh, but still, there is some work which remains in understanding how, how stable this method is going to be. Uh, yeah, so that's another example when we took, uh, we fabricated a matrix which, which has uh, eigenvalues which remains constant and then there is a drop, constant there is a drop, and then when we look at the convergence of randomized forms, then again we see those spikes, and then what we did was to look at what are the eigenvalues of the Hexenberg matrix when we have those spikes. So it happens that when we look exactly at the spike happening, then uh, there is a difference in between the eigenvalues of the Hessenberg matrix of the form method with respect to the randomized one. And basically, the very small uh, eigenvalues uh, of this Hessenberg matrix, which are called risk values, then the very small ones uh, can be negative or complex, and they are far from those of the form method. So there is a connection in between these uh, risk values and the convergence of the randomized method. And maybe that's a venue for exploring and maybe getting rid of these uh, spikes. And now I will uh, talk about this, uh, how do we use this technique for block reload methods? So I will um, quickly say about the block reload methods, but the, run but the organization part is quite straightforward because when you solve a block reload method, then now we are giving a uh, a block of right-hand sides if we solve linear systems, or if we solve an eigenvalue problem, then uh, we, we are again having uh, x, which is here uh, a block. And, and so in the block reload subspace method, now we are building a block subspace, starting by b and powers of the matrix a multiplied by this b. And then if we solve an eigenvalue problem, then we are going to impose a, a rally reads uh, condition. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm not going to go into the details of this block algorithm because now we are just simply giving a new block of vectors. We orthogonalize against the previous one by using, again, uh, a randomized projection, and then we orthogonalize the vectors among uh, themselves. Uh, so I'm going to, to skip this maybe, um, yes. Uh, yeah, and then, of course, when you go to a block version, uh, so sketching becomes uh, even more efficient because you don't sketch only one vector, you sketch a block of those vectors at once. But now let me just focus on the rally reads method. So when we solve a, a negative value problem by using a rally reads method, then uh, we, we do these uh, block iterations and then we are obtaining again this uh, relation with H being an upper Hessenberg and then the rally reads method will approximate the extreme eigenpairs of A by the eigenpairs uh, of this uh, Hessenberg uh, matrix by imposing a Galerkin uh, condition, which says that the residual, now if we look at the residual, uh, where mu is, my, is the approximated eigenvalue and u is an approximated eigenvector, then the residual is orthogonal to, to the Krylov subspace, which uh, was generated. And so in the deterministic case, another way of seeing this is once we impose this Galerkin orthogonalization condition, it implies, in fact, that we approximate the eigenpairs of A by the eigenpairs of this uh, 
projected matrix, where here the projector is an L2 orthogonal projector. If we go to the randomized version, we do the following. We approximate these eigenpairs uh, of A by the eigenpairs of this uh, projected matrix, but now that's not an L2 orthogonal projector, but it's again an orthogonal projector with respect to the sketched inner product. Why it's uh, cheaper? It's again because the communication is reduced and, and that's, that's the interest of using such a method. Again, we can say something about the, the convergence. Uh, so what would be interesting now is to see when uh, do we expect to get a good approximation of the eigenvalues of A? And so we have this uh, relation here, which, um, which depends on this uh, norm here, which, which says that we expect a small residual error when the Krilov subspace approximates well the range of A, or when the Krilov subspace is close to an invariant uh, space. But let me show you what we get in practice. So we are taking, um, again, this matrix I was taking before, and then we want to compute the smallest eigenvalues, eigenvectors. Uh, and so what we do first is to shift this matrix such that we compute the largest eigenvalues, eigenvectors. Uh, and then we, uh, we run this block law method and we apply the randomized rally reads procedure. And uh, let me show you some, uh, some convergence here in which we look at the uh, rally reads method and using different block gram schmidt algorithm. So we start with an initial guess of uh, 50 uh, columns of a Gaussian matrix. And then we run uh, the Arnoldi uh, iteration. Uh, and then we restart every 50 iterations. And so by 50, when we got to 50 iterations, we constructed uh, a basis which has uh, 200, uh, 2,500 uh, vectors. And then from this basis, we, we compute the um, approximated eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and then we restart from those and we keep iterating. And again, here we look at, uh, no, here we look at the error, uh, and then here we look at the condition number. Uh, and so uh, basically, CGS again doesn't work. So very quickly, CGS, uh, there is no convergence with the uh, eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and it corresponds to the condition number exploding quickly. Uh, and down here, what converges is uh, the block modified Gram Schmidt in green, and then the randomized uh, versions of the block Gram Schmidt. Uh, and uh, again, CGS twice uh, does converges. OK. Just to give you a bit of a history. Um, as I was saying, randomization was really used since more than 15 years for least squares problems, uh, for um, um, computing low rack approximations. And, and the focus here was on Krilov subspace method. So already uh, Oleg Balabanov and Antonin Nui use this sketch color kin condition for, for model order reduction. And then the focus in our work was to focus on Krilov subspace methods because those have very nice properties. Uh, and then uh, later on, uh, Eugenia Katsukasa and Joel Trop also looked at sketch Krilov methods, but now they are interested in uh, applying those sketching uh, regardless of the basis. So you can get this basis with just partial orthogonalization and so asymptotically do less flops and then sketch to solve the, the, the GM rest, for example. Uh, and now, more recently, uh, people apply this randomization for uh, computing functions of uh, matrices. So this uh, topic is uh, attracting some, some attention in the linear algebra community. If you, try, if you want to try, there is Julia code, MATLAB code, and then we have a library, uh, MPI, and C. Um, and so the focus here really to apply this to, of course, other eigenvalue solvers. With this, I'm happy to take your questions.